after I go. Okay. All right. We're back. Our cameras are ready. Our our right. sound is good. <laughs> um, so we're back with another AmeriCorps Connections podcast. And um, if you've landed on this podcast or this uh, YouTube page, um, good for you because you're in for a great conversation with another AmeriCorps alumni. Um, I'm super excited to be connecting with Rita Pratt today. And um, a little bit about this podcast. So my name is Nikki Fiaco. I am the founder of AmeriCorps Connections, and I'm AmeriCorps alumni of uh, Volunteer Maryland, a state national program. And while my AmeriCorps service was super impactful and you know, I made a big impact in my community. I was able to transport, transform parks in the environmental um, education field. Um, one of the biggest things that I took away was networking and connections. And so I really wanted to continue that work in the alumni field of AmeriCorps. And, um, you know, I've touched many arms of service. I've been a director of an AmeriCorps program. I've been a executive director of a commissions. Um, and now, I'm Nikki Fiago, and that's it, and it's wonderful. <laughs> so I'm super excited to invite you all to this podcast, and this is where we connect with AmeriCorps alum to listen to their service year and then find out where they are now and um, you know what they're up to and how their service year was a thread through maybe the decisions they made to, to get to this. And sometimes we all just kind of fall into it and, and continue the path. Before we get started, I want to always say thank you to Dan Medivere, um, from Time and Money, Time or Money Pro Productions, who was um, jumped on right away at the very beginning of this podcast, this adventure back in February 2023. And he said, I want to get you help you get you on all the platforms. And so if you're listening on iTunes or Apple Music, I think those are the same thing. Uh, Spotify. Um, that's that's due to Dan Medivere. So thank you so much, Dan. And he's an NCCC alumni. So it, we're all in this together. Um, I think that's all of my announcements. So I'm really excited to introduce Rita Pratt. Um, we are going to learn that we have this a history together that we kind of came in and out and we didn't actually know we know we knew each other until like a year or two after we knew each other. So it was really cool. So we'll get there. But Rita served at um, SVP in New Orleans, which is a uh, formerly St. Bernard project. Um, and it, it uh, established after Hurricane Katrina. Is that correct? That's right. Um, yeah. And so I'm going to let Rita go ahead and talk about um, where she started and where she is now. Um, fun fact, she is actually in the AmeriCorps agency now. And so very, I feel like I kind of have like I don't know, like a superstar on the podcast or something. So we'll just prob lob that up. <laughs> so take it away, Rita. They always want us to talk about our experience um, and, and bring in new members. So I am happy to share a bit of my background, but exactly what you said earlier is true. Like, I do think a lot of people fall into AmeriCorps and that's what we want to change, right? Like we want people to be intentional about you know, joining AmeriCorps and doing service and seeing it as, um, you know, an opportunity for growth and career advancement. And we're also happy to take everyone that falls into it, right? Um, so like she said, my name is Rita Pratt. I'm currently serving as the supervisory disaster services specialist in the disaster services unit at the AmeriCorps agency. I got here, um, if we go way, way back, in my history, and it's not really that far back, but I went to college in Boston. Um, I, I went for communications and marketing, and I was planning to actually go into sales. So I had a completely different expectation for the way my life was going to go. But while I was in college, I, I participated in service trips. So I did alternative spring break every spring. Um, I actually went to New Orleans um, actually I actually think it was the, the sophomore, junior, and senior years. I went to uh, New Orleans and served with SVP, which you mentioned before, formerly the St. Bernard Project. Uh, served with them as a volunteer, not as an AmeriCorps member, but as a volunteer. And as um, I was in my senior year and I was on the service trip, I was a, a leader for my uh, service trip. And they asked, um, and one of the AmeriCorps members there asked me what I was planning to do after college. And I really didn't have a firm plan at that point. It was March. And they said, you should be an AmeriCorps member. Like you have all the qualities, the leaders, you know, the leadership is 
obvious and apparent, why don't you apply to be an AmeriCorps member? And I loved those service trips. I always came back and felt extremely moved by the work we were able to do. And that just made a lot of sense to me. So I applied directly with SPP, which I know is a different uh, experience than others. I didn't have to go through any online platform through the agency. I just applied directly with them, uh, which worked out in my favor, I believe. And I got into the program, was super excited. I served uh, the early part of my term in New Orleans and then immediately was put on a disaster response team. Uh, there was a Hurricane Joaquin that hit South Carolina and I was put on a specialized team. It wasn't a formal AmeriCorps disaster response team with the agency, but it was a, a separate one with our program. And I went to South Carolina and served there. Um, I stayed there for the rest of my term until SBP hired me on. Uh, and I was hired on, I think it was, it was a communications specialist or, or something like that in Texas. So I moved there after the 2016 Memorial Day floods. Uh, I stayed there. They moved me back to South Carolina. They wanted to move me back to Texas. And at that point, I was just ready to settle a bit. So that is when I joined the South Carolina Service Commission. Uh, I started there uh, doing disaster services and also their external affairs. So I was getting a little bit back to my comms route, which I really loved, um, but still kept that disaster focus. Um, there I was sitting, I believe it was ESF 14 emergency, um, emer for a South Carolina emergency. Why am I blanking? South Carolina Nikki, help me out here. South Carolina Emergency Management. Thank you. It's been a long day. It has um, been a long day. <laughs> so I was supporting that um, directly with the state. And that was a really, really good opportunity, a great learning opportunity for me. After that, I moved to Virginia to be with my now wife and girlfriend. And I had the opportunity to apply for the team lead for the disaster services unit. Was fortunate to, to get that position. And yeah. That's where I've been since 2020. And it was a really interesting time to onboard because it was June of 2020, uh, right? Joining the disaster services unit right at the height of the COVID pandemic. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I interviewed Paul Nolan and I know we have mutual, you've worked with Paul as well. And he he said that he came on during the pandemic as well. So it was really interesting to like start building relationships with folks virtually and and really not seeing each other yeah and I and I can't imagine when it when it comes to disaster services like you really can't I don't know address a disaster through a zoom call I can't imagine <laughs> I mean right you know in my position thankfully I can um but no we did have to get members out on the ground and and put in COVID precautions and at a certain point we said like well, how do we find that balance between making sure folks are safe from COVID, um, make sure that we're testing, make sure that we're quarantining, just like everybody was doing, but also making sure that people are being served in the wake of disaster. Fortunately, I think we only had three natural disaster responses in that first year. So there was the derecho in Iowa. I think there were there was a hurricane in Florida and a hurricane in Louisiana. Um, and so we, we didn't have much in terms of natural risk, disaster response, but there was a lot to put in place. In the next calendar year, 2021, is where we saw the bigger challenge because that's when we started doing vaccinations and testing and contact tracing. So we actually had, I believe it was 27 mission assignments total. And before that, on average, three to five a year, Nikki. So Holy definitely smokes. went through the gauntlet. We've never had more mission assignments than we did in that, that my first full year in this position. I want, I want to go back to the 20, the, I want to go back to the 2021 vaccines and, and how you manage that. But I want to just touch back on sure. how did your, how do you think that your very first service term that you did with SVP, um, right? SVP or with South Carolina? SBP. Okay. Um, how do you think that that prepared you for making decisions in the future of taking opportunities or making decisions? What was it during that service year that maybe prepared you for that? 
Wow, I haven't thought about that in a long time, but I actually do frequently reflect on the fact that every experience we have brings us to where we are today. Every person that has given us an opportunity. I got so much out of that service experience and it was even evident to me at the time. Uh, you know, I had the opportunity to join that specialized disaster response team and there's only five of us, you know, that were selected out of the whole program to do that. And I was brand new. Um, I had to make the decision to leave my cohort right away. Like immediately I had to make a decision. Like, am I, I just moved to New Orleans. Um, you know, having them offer me a position after my term wasn't expected. Um, and so I remember that was really challenging because I had a sales job lined up back in Boston, a really good one. You know, they were trying to offer me cars and cell phones and computers, things that AmeriCorps members just do not have the opportunity to have. And, yeah. you know, I, I had gone 10 months without many luxuries. And so I think it, I'm not sure if I'm fully answering your question, but I think it really changed the entire trajectory of my life because I found such a passion with the work that I was, or the, the service that I was doing and providing in the communities I was in, but it also tested me. Like it made me ask the really important questions. What do you care about? Do you care about money and cars or do you care about people? Do you care about that feeling that you're getting right now? I think you can, you know, hopefully one day we'll all get both. Right. But like I was 22 years old, 20, 22, 23 years old, like, what did I care about then? What was important? Um, and they gave, they gave me the opportunity in that program to come face to face with people in their darkest days. I mean, I, you know, everyone has the stories, but connecting directly with homeowners post impact, that, that still stays with me. And it's something I don't get to, you know, the opportunity to have as, as frequently now, but, um, that certainly changed my perspective on what's important. Um, so, you know, college taught me a lot. I, I think I have the skills to do my job, which is phenomenal, but this really gave me a purpose. Yeah, that, that may, you just summed it up like so well, like college gave you the skills and then the, um, the AmeriCorps service. Cause I always say that like, when I entered my service year, I didn't enter it like altruistically, like, oh, I want to make a difference. I really didn't. I wasn't <laughs> like, but when I started to see that I could solve problems and that I could like galvanize volunteers to put their energies, and I was focused on environmental sustainability and stuff like that, put their energies towards solving these environmental issues. It, like, I feel like it, you know, and I did my service year later in my life. And so for all of you that are listening, like I did this in my mid thirties, um, okay. it's, but it started to shape my values. Right. And, and, yeah. and I, yeah. And I think that like, if somebody takes their service year seriously, and then we reflect back on it, it's like, oh, that's when I decided. And I realized what I'm willing to stand for and what I'm, what I just, I won't, which is, a, you know, what do they say? Like, it's a, a non-negotiable. Like, I'm just, yeah, I'm not going to do that. And I think that what you said, if you found your passion, and I think that that word passion is fueled right now, like everyone's like, find your passion. But I think that linked into those interactions that we get as a, as a service member, when we're in the field, it, it ties into that, like, that actual value of you becoming a person and you can become a new person in your mid thirties as, as well as you can when you're shaped right out of college and 20 something years old, right? Like yep. it shifts. And, you know, I was a mother of young kids at the time. So it, it was like, some of these things were new to me where I'm like, Oh, like I didn't know that I was volunteering when I was coaching my kids soccer. Right. Like I didn't know that until AmeriCorps <laughs> said to me, that's volunteering. I'm like, that's called parenting. You know, <laughs> they're like, well, I mean, all the other parents are sitting on the sidelines and you're actually coaching, you know? And so like, suddenly I learned that, Oh, service and giving back and being involved is a value of mine. Um, so I think that's, that makes a lot of sense. I think it was always a value of mine 
service and volunteering. I, I mean, my first job, Nikki, this is so funny. I lied to a theater to so that I could volunteer to work at the theater. Like I, I really just, you know, I think I've always been invested in service. I actually chose to do AmeriCorps as opposed to like a Peace Corps opportunity because I recognized that there were so many challenges domestically. And I do mm-hmm. think that's because I had those service opportunities in college. I really saw it firsthand even before AmeriCorps. Um, but I completely agree during my service term, I saw career opportunities blossom. I mean, I was offered a yes. contracting job, you know, like just in, in different, in different, um, areas that I never would have even considered, uh, which is really cool, especially if you're doing this later in life and you're trying to career transition. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's like the, the genesis of this podcast. I mean, I, this is, you are 24 because uh, Trey was so excited that he was 23 because that's Jordan's number. And he was like, I am the goat. So he has designated himself as the goat of this podcast. So we'll see. We'll see. (laughs) Yeah. It's not about content. It's just about podcast number. It's probably you. That's the goat. You've done (laughs) 24 of these now. Yeah. And, and, but yes. And I forget why I was saying that. Um, Oh, because nobody's doing the same thing, right? Like, Mm. like there's a handful of folks that are still like really, really in like you are working for the AmeriCorps agency. You know what I mean? Paul is working for the AmeriCorps agency, but I interviewed folks that were working for Netflix. I interviewed folks that like Kate Morton, she did an NCCC year she was on a reservation building like a health club or something for um, the the kids on the reservation. And she noticed like the disparity in health, access to health, which led her into a pharmaceutical position. And now she has like a, um, a, a trial pharmaceutical company where she's able to provide like AIDS um prescript uh, uh medicine to folks that can't afford I mean this is because maybe of she's her- the goat yes wow. I mean, this is because of her N triple C year I think it yeah. was episode five or six I mean she literally says on the podcast like she was working at CVS and her boss was like you should become a pharmaceutical like a pharmacist and she's like I don't want to do that and then she did N triple C and then she enrolled in pharmacy school and now she's saving the world in in New Mexico so you know and so like for so what you said is like these opportunities open up in AmeriCorps and that's yeah. like really what I want to get to in this podcast is like you can do anything you want because AmeriCorps prepares you for that because there's, there's really no script. It's like, well, this is kind of the project. So figure it out. Yeah, I can, com- I completely agree. And I, I look at a lot of my friends from college and I mean, we're, you're really young when you go to college, if you choose to go to college, you may already know what trade you want to go into. And so I just think it should be a door open for anyone who's interested in career transition and, and different opportunity. Yeah, I, I really am excited that AmeriCorps, AmeriCorps and some of the tangential organizations that are connected with AmeriCorps, sorry, my door just slammed, are um, focusing on, are, are refocusing on this like workforce development sort of piece of it where, you know, it's not always for somebody that's coming out of college. It's for folks that are either doing job transitioning or they just don't know what they want to do. I tell people that all of the time. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so anything else that you want to reflect on during your service here, we can just move forward on your journey. Let's move forward because I could talk forever about AmeriCorps and my service here. I love it. Um, okay, so 27 missions gone from, I think you said seven to five missions each year. So in 2021, um, and I think this might be a really fun point to just interject yes. that like that's where we kind of, we crossed paths so mm-hmm. I was in the governor's office of service and volunteerism with, with in Maryland in Governor Hogan's administration. And there was a vaccine site in, where was that? Um, Maryland. Well, it was Maryland. Yes. <laughs> oh, was, um, well. At the Metro. It's not, it's not very, it's not very, uh, of course, to me because I had 27, but it was yeah. our Maryland vaccine mission. I don't remember. I couldn't tell you where that yeah. was. So, and, and I remember, and this is the funniest thing that I'm going to remember about that is that it was really hot. It was like a summer sort of day. 
and everybody was masked up and which I would always get really, really sweaty whenever I was wearing the mask. So I was like very nervous to be around like these AmeriCorps like headquarter folks. And you got out of the car and you had like a black um, dress suit on. And I was in like a cardigan and like, <laughs> like I think I'm even sandals on because I'm like, it's hot. Like <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm so underdressed for this. But I was just, and, and, That's and so then, funny. That was the funny thing, but I also want to reflect on that place was so organized and the AmeriCorps members were motivated and you all were so focused on um, the well-being of the AmeriCorps members because it was hot and we did have to have protocol to make sure people were safe. Um, how did you like show up in those, 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 that role and, you know, like, how'd you do it, man? <laughs> yeah. Actually, let's go back to the outfit. I didn't know what to wear either. Uh, I was I was also new, and we, we we weren't going on site frequently. That was one of my first site visits. Yes. So it was cool. It was cool to meet up with you. I think we even met up in the parking lot before they came yes. to collect us. But those vaccine missions were run by FEMA, and so they were unique. So all of our I can give you a little bit of an understanding of a mission assignment, but. Uh, when there's a federally declared disaster, we are uh, an opportunity. We we have um, we have capacity to support FEMA, and that's the Federal Emergency Management Agency, in responding to those disasters. And what that looks like can be very different across the board. But typically, we set up independent operations. So they fund us. We set up independent operations, say we're mucking and gutting homes. We give them a goal. We work on it pretty independently. They fund us. We give them updates. These vaccine mission assignments were run by FEMA. So we were providing members. Mm. We were providing oversight for those members. Um, we were, you know, the, the POC for those members, but they were being run by FEMA, um, which was really actually nice because there were so many of them and we could rely on our partners to be the, the point of contact on the ground and ensure that you know everything was happening safe um and so yeah i feel like reflecting back on this it feels like a hundred years ago because we were just in disaster response mode for so long with the fema mission assignments yeah. for covid um but they were very unique and um our, our members for the most part did enjoy that service because it's very, you know, it's very obvious that you're impacting humans, like you're working with them, but it isn't our typical mission assignment. So some of them were very much like, I'd much rather be doing conservation work or cutting down trees or mucking homes, but that's, that was the need. And, and we always say that AmeriCorps goes and fills the, the gap. We fill the gap in the need, especially on disaster response. Um, so yeah, I think those were done very effectively because of our standing partnership with FEMA and really helped our partnership as an agency with FEMA going forward because they saw how professional our members were. I mean, you saw how professional those members yep. were. I mean, we even had, a, I remember we had like a, a member conflict and they were like, yes, taking it to the side. They were like, we don't want to talk about this in front of the clients or, you know, whatever they're calling them. Um, and so it really helped um, our agency partnership and we've still, we are still seeing ripple effects from that. Yeah. So, you know, so 20, so the, the, uh, pandemic response is something that was totally different than what, um, the disaster services unit of AmeriCorps does. So let's talk about like in a non-pandemic year, uh, and I know that you, you weren't with the agency without that, and we're not fully out of that yet, I don't think. So like, is there a norm or has the norm changed or like how many how many missions are you on now <laughs> we've still got a lot <laughs> but we're creating new norms um okay. you know i think hurricane harvey had something like 400 americorps members respond total wow. you know that uh you know capacity is significantly reduced uh recruitment i think is leveling out but hit a, a pretty hit a pretty low bottom a while ago and so our teams just look smaller. Um, you know, also I think funding is difficult uh, to get. So our programs are making 
other commitments, other contracts. So mm-hmm. say it's, you know, a conservation court, they're making other contracts with different agencies and different partners. So they have other commitments and they may not be always available to respond. So I think setting the norm with our partners in response and saying, this is re- typically what we, we send right now, we're t- typically sending between 30 and 50 members, as opposed to those enormous 400 person numbers, um, you know, 30 to 50, giving more reasonable targets of what we can get accomplished. Um, and we're doing 30 to 60 day mission assignments, depending. Of course, it all depends on the level of, of the disaster um, and what the need is. And we, you know, the need can be anything from volunteer management to mold, uh, you know, mold suppression, mucky and gutting, debris removal. But there are also opportunities for, you know, crisis cleanup, which is a, a platform that uh, we use in, 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 in many disasters mm-hmm. um, for homeowners to call into and express their need. And there's also an opportunity for us to do that virtually, to make those call downs virtually and figure out what what the outstanding needs are. That's cool because that completely came out of COVID. We wouldn't have necessarily thought of, you know, these virtual options had we not been forced into them before. And so I do think there's been um, some opportunities opened from from that uh, response in COVID. Yeah. Um, And when I was in South Carolina, we were starting to set up those call centers. Um, mm. We were in the we were in the process of getting the mechanisms ready for that. So for those listeners that are are new to this work, because you're the first, I've had a lot of NCCC members on here, but you're the first like focus on disaster services. Um, and you've mentioned a couple of times about like your teams and and I know what that means. Um, could you just briefly say like, where are you getting these AmeriCorps members from? Um, what are teams? You know, we can even go into like what an ADART is. Um, and then also I, I do want to like clarify what that, um, the call in, I forget what it's called, the uh, where homeowners can call in. Crisis cleanup. Was the a, crisis it's cleanup. one of many platforms. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let's start with just really briefly of sure. um, like 101, what's a, what's a, Disaster team. 101. Oh, 101. Um, well, I have trainings online. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know. No. We can put you um, in that direction. Which you took, which you were, I remember you were one of the only people that actually took those trainings before we had our disaster convening. So thank you. Yeah. So um, fun fact, folks, yeah. I went to a disaster, um, disaster services training in, um, was it in San Antonio? Austin in 2022, August. It was in Austin in 2022. And I am a nerd. I am a certified nerd, 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 nerd. And so there was, there was certified, there were classes or courses that we had to take. And I made sure I took all of them. And I was really annoyed because I couldn't finish them and get my certificate badge (laughs) before the training. And so um, Rita's counterpart or, or a a, Katrina. a wonderful woman that she works with is Katrina, which yes, we've got a Katrina and a Rita in the disaster service yes, branch. Um, Katrina and I were on a uh, back and forth. I was like, please give me my certificate before I go to this training. So thank you for pointing that out. Yes. I'm a total nerd. So we loved it. We loved it. So I, yes. And we do have a Katrina and we do have a Rita. And I always tell her that she overshadowed me. If you know anything about hurricanes, <laughs> Katrina and Rita. Um, so an AmeriCorps disaster response team is a specialized AmeriCorps uh, team that usually comes out of a program. So um, we have currently 28 AmeriCorps disaster response teams, including NCCC. NCCC makes up a majority of um, our capacity, but there are frequently mission assignments that, that we deploy on that, that don't have NCCC. So it just depends on what the need is and what the current availability is. Um, these are specialized teams, but most uh, most programs have the opportunity to opt in if it's something they're interested in. And all it requires is a cooperative agreement between the program and the agency. Um, it's a different source of funding because this is FEMA funding. It's all reimbursable. The programs are responsible for any uh, funding upfront. So deploying their members, that all happens upfront and then we reimburse them. But these programs are uh, 
frequently conservation corps, um, um, state service commissions that, that create composite teams, uh, any sort of you know, disaster program, like we mentioned, SVP. Uh, and, and that's typically what we're seeing, although I'm looking to expand into other types of programs because I think there's a place for them as well. Um, you know, we were talking about, uh, you and I weren't talking about this, but I was just talking about this with my team and we're looking to build our aid art capacity and really be thoughtful about the work that member or the service that members are doing because I don't want to put a conservation core necessarily into a sheltering situation where mm -hmm. it might be best to have a program that specializes in working with that population, you know, to, to do that sheltering and then putting the conservation core who, who is experienced with sawyering or chainsawing uh, out in the field. And so being more um, deliberate with that is something we're working to do so that we can increase our non-conservation environmental justice programs. Is that good? Yeah, no, you that's more great. on aid arts. No, okay. that that's 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 great. And if you obviously if, if people want more information about that, um if you run an AmeriCorps program or um are part of a commission, we'll have all of the links in the show notes. Um and then yeah. real quick, the crisis cleanup. Um I think this is just really great information that not only AmeriCorps members need to know about, but people need to know that this exists. So if you could just briefly explain what that is. Yeah, so to be clear, it is, I think uh, it's not always operational depending on the disaster response, but typically when a disaster hits your community, your governor, your mayor will put out a phone number for you to call into and express your current needs. So if there's an outstanding need, there's a tree on my car, you know, my windows are blown in, I have mold in my kitchen, you call that number and you put it in and there's a needs record of some sort. Um, and so typically what we see is when we come into a community that needs record is overflowing. Um, you know, we're only coming in and uh, we're only coming in as an agency in the event that the storm is bad enough, the need is great enough and there's, you know, 400 plus people who are, who are waiting to be served. So sometimes those lists get really outdated and they get really out of control really fast. And so we have certain AmeriCorps disaster response teams that are specialized in doing call downs of those lists. Um, and why I think it's great for anyone to know is that, you know, getting your name on that list, if you're in need, um, you know, doesn't guarantee service, but it certainly puts your name out there. Um, and it's, you know, usually the only full record that a community will have as far as outstanding needs. I say that. And then also I recognize that we look at those lists and we serve the most vulnerable populations first. Um, you know, elderly, those with children, those um, with different abilities. So we, we have to, uh, we have to look at it that way, but um, yeah, I think we, we as a, as a country, as communities, always we're trying to do our best to maintain those lists. But we've definitely had frequent times, Nikki, where they've called us and said, we just need you to do crisis cleanup call downs. I mean, mm -hmm. when I was, when I was working a response and I was with the South Carolina Service Commission, we had a, an AmeriCorps disaster response team came in and that's all they did. They, they cleaned down our list. Mm -hmm. um, people service themselves too, you know, like they get, okay, they've got a tree on their truck. They're not going to leave that for two months. <laughs> they might just pay to get that done. And so then we got to get that off the list. So we understand the actual remaining need. And, and I think it's one of the things I think so important is for folks to understand, like anybody that's listening to this, that is either part of the AmeriCorps um, network, maybe you've served or you've been part of a program or you haven't, these are all the different things that AmeriCorps does, right? Like this, like we don't, we're not just tutoring kids. We're not, you know, we're not just building capacity in nonprofits. Like these members that are called in for these these types of things, they are removing trees off of cars. And then also importantly, like making sure, and I'm a, again, a dork because I love databases, like cleaning up databases, which makes a difference because then you don't deploy energy and services into areas that they don't need to need to be. And if we're looking to make sure that we're spending federal funds efficiently and effectively, 
that is so important. And it, yep. it may seem like a little thing to, you know, press complete or whatever it might be on that project, but it it's huge. And, and these are opportunities that AmeriCorps members have that actually have a direct impact. Yeah, and if programs are listening, I, I always think it, it must, and we don't have any data on this that I know of, but it must be good for recruitment for some of these programs to not only offer the opportunity to train their members on prescribed burns, on conservation, on soiring, but also to offer the opportunity that if there is a disaster, you may have the opportunity to deploy. And that's a fully different set of skills. I mean, transferable, but a different experience entirely than going out and spending, you know, 10 weeks backpacking and doing trails. It's, it's different. Um, and they'd have both opportunities as an AmeriCorps disaster response team. Yeah, for sure. I'm a big fan. Um, I was excited when I was down in South Carolina building out that I, it was, it was actually kind of, I know, I know we were so close. Um, but I was excited when I got down there and, and folks, I, I, those listening, I, I pulled out the archived communications and strategy plan that Rita had. And uh, we started a little bit of momentum, um, but things happen in AmeriCorps. So, uh, yeah. you know, you, uh, you bend and you, 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 you move on. Um, so what else do you want to share about? Um, so I want to like, AmeriCorps is not your entire life, right? Like this is what you, like, we all kind of like are on the national service trajectory, but we're all people too. Um, yeah. and you know, like I used to have a, a, a background and I decided that I wanted people to know that I'm kind of an astrology nut and I love the moon. And yes, I put crystals out inside when there's a full moon to, to <laughs> cleanse them and collect moon water and do, you know, things. Um, and so we like, and that was part, like part of I don't know, part of my service year was also bringing in my personal values and making sure that like it, it, you know, giving back and being part of environmental education wasn't just because like it was a cool thing to do. And that was my major. I truly grew up eating fruit off trees. And so it was just part of who I was. So when we think about Rita beyond the <laughs> disaster services, like I, I don't know, books you could re recommend, meditations that you do. Do you hike? Like, who is You're Rita? stressing me out, Nikki. I feel like I'm back in therapy. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, uh, this, this would be great. <laughs> yeah. No, AmeriCorps is my life. No, I'm just kidding. I, it, yeah. You know, obviously, our, our jobs and our careers are a big part of our day to day. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I actually talk about this with my wife and Working in disaster response has changed me as a human. It's changed my emotional response. Um, mm. And a lot of my life, you know, works around that. You know, like even in, in conversation, sometimes I just go into disaster response mode and I just want to fix the problem and not have feelings, Nikki, right? Mm. <laughs> so I feel like that's one thing I've actually been exploring a lot this year is like, not going into the disaster response mode. And I'm sure like, I'm not a first responder, but I'm sure that first responders feel that on a completely different degree than I do. Um, so a, a lot of my, you know, free time is just about regulating, like going to the gym, enjoying time outside. I'm, I love to be outside. I am, if I'm going to go to a restaurant with you, we are sitting outside. I, I will not be sitting inside. Um, so as much time as I can get outside, um, I absolutely love traveling. I, I love that this this job allows me to travel a lot and especially to places that like I, I wouldn't go otherwise. You know, I once deployed out to Nebraska and had the best time. And people are so tired of me hearing about how cool Nebraska or hearing from me about how cool Nebraska is, but I really did have a great time there. Um, so definitely traveling. Um, I enjoy a lot of different things I'm trying not to just create a list for you <laughs> but to talk about traveling I just I went to Sweden uh two weeks ago with my wife who is an athletic trainer for a girls or a youth soccer tournament it's like the biggest youth soccer tournaments the youth world cup um and no it was way. so much fun but also completely unexpected like why you know I would never have gone to Gothenburg Sweden 
uh, unless we had this random cool opportunity. Um, we also do just love watching women's soccer. So we've been watching the World Cup and the devastating- Did you watch the US on <sighs> Sunday? I watched Can we the last a- PK. I woke up and watched the, like just turned on and I, I watched them lose. Like that's all I got to see even then I rewatched it. I, I woke up at um, 4.45 and I thought, am I going to do this? And I said, yes, I'm going to do this. And I had like five cups of coffee and I was oh. watching it and I, I actually was like physically ill and uh, I mean, I could go into it. Like, so my daughter plays soccer. Um, okay. She, she plays soccer in college and she's, she's won a national championship oh, wow. and like, it's a, it's a whole thing. Our family's a soccer. Did she family. ever go to the youth world cup? Did she go to Gothenburg? No, but I'm going to have to look into, I was like, right. In, she's running in and out of the house right now. Cause she's okay. going, she's going back up to school um, next week. But um yeah, I watched that game and I just, it was, there was a lot to say about that game. They played so well. They played so well. Like I kept saying, this is it, this is it. And, and the keeper was on the, um, who did they play? They played, um, nether, not nether, uh, um, Sweden. They played Sweden. They played Sweden. That yeah. keeper was on point was it like, my fault because I went to Sweden yes, to watch soccer it's all your fault in fact 100. if in fact uh, if oh. um if, if uh Rapino is listening to this I'll give no. you <laughs> read his address <laughs> no no but so, I, I okay. also feel strongly about people not blaming her because I've oh, seen a yes. lot of like I've seen a lot of hate and yes. I'm like the, all that woman did for the program for women equal Please pay stop the hate so anyway so soccer okay you love traveling I might I have to traveling cut this out. I, I like we soccer. that's fine tangent. I like traveling I like soccer <laughs> I, I I usually go to orange I'm actually I do orange theory so I'm if my friends ask you uh-huh. I'm probably going for a walk I'm going to orange theory I'm lighting candles I'm doing the same thing you're doing um but yeah I, we live in Alexandria Virginia so we're right over the border from dc and there's obviously so much to do there yeah so i feel like i'm always doing something um always um spending time with my friends but i think future career trajectory i'm really happy working with the agency right now and i and i always say that to my team like i have a phenomenal team with good people and good culture and you know, it hasn't always been the case for me that I'm just like content where I am, but I do feel very happy about going to work every day. I mean, it's hard work. I'm, I am tired. Today has been a long day, but I do feel that same sense of AmeriCorps pride working for the agency yeah. and knowing that I'm working with a group of like-minded people that, that just want to get things done for America. And I know that sounds cheesy, but it's very true. I mean, it, it rings true throughout the whole agency. I just went down to Texas um, and I got the opportunity to work with our communications team. And I hadn't had a lot of you know experience with them before. And it was very evident to me that they care about diversity and equity and making things better, you know, taking, taking um, maybe opportunities that weren't so great and making them, you know, take, learn, yep. t- uh, turning them into learning opportunities. It's really cool. Um, so I, I'm not exactly sure what's next for me. It's clearly how I've lived my life up until this point. So I will wait for that to come and it will yeah. manifest good things for me. But right now I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm happy. I'm happy going to Orange Theory and going to work. <laughs> I love that. And something that I think is important when people are thinking about their next opportunity, it's for me, I was really stuck in, um, like what I wanted to do and what, what I wanted to do and who I wanted to show up as. And then when I finally let that go and I was like, how do I want to feel like, who do I want to be around? Yes. <laughs> yes. You're just like connecting with me so much. I just remember being in college and people would say, well, what do you want to do? And I would say, I want to be happy. Yeah. And I remember people laughing like, no, I, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, and so I think to your point about, there was one thing I wanted to circle back in and then we can start wrapping this down is um, 
the fact that you didn't use this word, but kind of that compartmentalization when you're working on tough things and you're, yeah. you know, and an AmeriCorps year can require somebody to do some compartmental compart compartmentalization, compartment. <laughs> compartmentalizing <laughs> to, do, to put things in a cut box it, and store cut it, it. <laughs> cut it to put things in a box and store it somewhere else um compartmentalizing that still sounds wrong anyways um <laughs> so I think one of the things that that has come out well maybe it even was before the pandemic but I think something that's really cool um in the my nine to five, we still have a Vista program. So it's kind of fun. I'm not running it, but I get to be involved with it. And, and we do talk about like how to deal with those situations, right? Like, and I think AmeriCorps programs need to think about like when you're putting an AmeriCorps member into a situation that they maybe never have had to deal with before, um, giving them the skills and the tools to, to work through that, maybe not in that moment, but to be able to take a breath or take a walk and what are the skills that we need to learn to to deal with some of the things that are in our job that you know we weren't necessarily trained for yeah and i'm sure that spans across all programs yeah absolutely um pink do we want to talk about pink <laughs> should we talk about pink you didn't mention why your voice was raspy i know so um so for those, my regular listeners, I think I have 45 people um, that are subscribed on YouTube. So if you're still listening, please continue to subscribe because apparently it helps the algorithms. But um, I sound like, um, I don't know, George right now because I went to a pink concert last night and I did not stop yelling for two and a half, three hours. And it was the most amazing show. I cried. No I jumped. One blames you. I, I didn't even know that I could jump up and down for three and a half hours. I didn't know I had it in me. Did you go to a three and a half hour orange theory class? It's that's what it seems like. <laughs> I don't know what orange so much theory. cardio. You don't it know what so, orange theory is. I mean, I've seen like the, I've seen the it's so storefront. It's a hit but... workout. It's just a hit workout. It's like running, lifting and rowing. So it's just an intense one hour workout. And I can imagine that's what you were doing at pink. Yeah. Just all out cardio, all out jumping. Um, nobody blames you. That concert was amazing. I also went on Saturday in Pittsburgh um, and it was the pink eras tour. I mean, she sang songs across all of her albums, which that, yeah. they don't always do that. I mean, you know, it's usually the new stuff and we didn't really get much of her new stuff. Yeah. Um, yes. And I love that. And I did. I, so I don't know if you follow, follow Mel Robbins and Abby Wambach. Um, so they have a podcast. Oh, um, they have a podcast. I, oh, I, yeah. I listen to the Glennon Doyle podcast. With no, Abby, I didn't, but... that's who I meant. Not, not Mel Robbins. I mean, I oh, love okay. Mel Robbins, but Glennon okay, Doyle. We can do hard things. Yeah. Yes. So they were prepping for, um, the, um, Taylor Swift, Swift concert and Abby Wambach was, looking at the um lyrics and she was practicing them and like that was literally me for like the last week and a half and like I had him in my yes and I had him in my car driving and I was maybe I shouldn't record and so I I was a passenger in a car <laughs> and I was reading them and so when I got to the concert I knew the words and I felt like you got to just find these videos of Abby I was able I to think say I did see them I think yes, I did see I, them. Yeah. I was able to say the words and I, I said them so loud and so proud. I'm like, I know exactly what she's saying because I spent a week and a half. <laughs> I don't even think I needed to study. I knew the words. I knew the words. And the only song I really just learned was Trust Ball, but still knew the words because I've been listening for a while. I just actually had a it. Spotify playlist, Nikki, that was a, a, a warm up. So I put all the songs that I thought they would sing. And I listened to that for a long time. So I love it. I love commitment. It, it is commitment. Um, well, this has been, this has been quite, this is almost like an AmeriCorps journey. You just never know where you're going to end up. <laughs> right. I did listen to Paul's podcast and I know that I'm very different than Paul, but <laughs> yeah, well, maybe that makes for, maybe that makes for a fun podcast that they don't know what they're going to expect. Or I what think, they're gonna get. Um, all the guests have been so, um, uh, just unique and everybody's story is different and I think that's just the thing about AmeriCorps is we're all 
experience a similar but very different experience. And, you know, there's there's over a million of us who have served. And at, at some point, you know, we we need we can do something with our voices. And so I'll, we'll close it out. I always ask this question sort of, you know, um, what do you see for this AmeriCorps alumni group? Like, what what could we do? Like, what do you see us doing moving forward? I think the biggest piece for me is that community building uh, across the country mm -hmm. and um, making opportunities for people to feel safe, and comfortable and able to take the leap of faith to move and follow a dream and know that there's gonna be people there that are like-minded and that will catch them um, and, and people that they can turn to. And maybe even more than that will help, you know, with their next career transition or invite them to a pottery class, invite them to a soccer game, because I really do think that's one of the biggest challenges in, you know, people following some of their dreams is just, leaving community behind and community is so so important and we all experience it when we're in AmeriCorps like there is a good sense of community across our programs I know some you know some programs are different um you know VISTAs may have individual placement but you know that you're part of the AmeriCorps I don't want to say family but you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. um and I'd like I'd like that to extend past their year of service um that's exactly what I was looking for when I left and I know that I know that that still rings true for a lot of people. I love that. And that's really what I'm trying to build with the community connections. I know there, you know, Service Year Alliance is doing stuff with AmeriCorps alum, the AmeriCorps agency is doing things. Um, and, you know, it, it's going to take a village to bring us all back together because, like you said, we all kind of identify in different ways. But like the strongest place that I've found for people to connect is the AmeriCorps alums in LinkedIn you know, we're sharing professional development opportunities, we're sharing job opportunities, and, um, you know, hopefully we can build some type of community, and I, I really feel strongly that in the next couple of years, we can come out strong. I do want to add that I'm one of the co-chairs of Pride AmeriCorps, and what okay. I learned from that was I wanted to jump in and, you know, create job opportunities and mentorship and xyz and i was told and pulled back and said we first just have to make this social we need to make this fun we need to make it so that people want to stay a part of this community and like, be a part of this community there has to be some sort of draw beyond like the professional and and, and okay. that and so maybe if you're uh, looking for different opportunities remembering that as well um the social aspect is super important so we could have an AmeriCorps, a Pride AmeriCorps Fun Day. Oh, that would All, be really fun. Like across the US. That would be really fun. Like during AmeriCorps week. Well, we actually did something similar, but we can talk about this. Let's, yeah, let's definitely pull that thread um, because we know that's a big community in AmeriCorps as well. Yeah, definitely. All right, anything else that you wanna close out with? This is your no, time. I'm so excited. Thank you for inviting me on this podcast. As soon as I saw it, I got really excited because I have been passionate about this. I tried to work with service year when I was in South Carolina as well to build alumni connections. It's something I, like I said, I was looking for, and I'm, if I can do anything to bring more people into the AmeriCorps network, I'm happy to do that. So thank you for the invitation and please cut out anything ridiculous that I've said. <laughs> okay. Great. I definitely will. I definitely don't, will. Because and then I'm relatable. It's funny. I, like, I'm just like the Jennifer Lawrence of your podcast. And you can just be okay with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, for those of you that hung in this long, thank you so much. And I'll be at, uh, next week with another, connecting with another AmeriCorps alumni. And we'll do the same thing. Have a wonderful conversation, Rita. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm super excited to um, get this thing out to everybody. And uh, we'll be back next week. Thank you all. Thank See you. ya.